Hi, and thank you for tuning in to the Reach Church Podcast. You're listening to our sermon series, One. Here's Pastor Chris with this week's message. This series, we're going to celebrate the giver of the gift. We've titled this series, One, for a very specific reason, and it comes out of this, Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 5 through 7. The word says this, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is father of all and who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Jesus Christ. One God, look what it says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Father, and one gift given in to us. And with that said, this is what we're going to break down over the next five Sundays in the month of March is each one of these topics. Today, we're kicking off with one Lord. But before we get into it, I just want to tell you, this scripture in itself is provocative. This scripture in itself is considered to be one of the most extreme scriptures found in the Word of God. You know why? Because there is no wiggle room for anything else to be right if this is true. Are you with me? If there's really one Lord, really one faith, one baptism, one God the Father, and one gift, then what it says to the world is nothing else that is out there is right. It's all a twist on the truth, but it's not the truth because here this statement is declaring there's just one. There's not two. There's not three gods. There's not five lords. There's not 1.1 Lord. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one gift given in to humanity, and that gift is given by Jesus. Do you believe that today? If you're on the fringe, we're going to help you because here is the truth. To make this kind of statement, the Bible has either got to be accurate or it's got to be radically crazy. And Jesus himself, to make these kind of statements, either he has to be right, he has to be true, or he's got to be crazy. And I'll tell you, even other religions believe in Jesus, believe Jesus existed. History shows us that Jesus walked this earth. Whether or not anyone wants to believe he is the one Lord, whether they want to step that far and believe it or not, doesn't change the fact of their belief system that Jesus was a man who lived here on earth, who was crucified in Israel by the Roman Empire upon the request of the Jewish synagogue the Jewish, the religious leaders. So that is an established historical fact. It's found in the Roman Empire's bookkeeping. It's found in other historical bookkeeping from men like Josephus, who was a Hebrew historian. Jesus existed. Whether people want to say he was God, he was Lord, or not, it doesn't change the fact of the cold, hard truth that Jesus was on earth. Do you believe that? Jesus was here, and while he was here, it has been recorded in multiple books throughout the Bible and in other historical books that he himself was making these crazy radical claims that he's not just a man, but that he's all man, and yet he's all God. So Jesus is either telling the truth or he's nuts. That's just a cold hard facts. But do you know this? That even the Muslim belief system, even their top-notch teachers, their imams, they're, they're, they're guys that are the apostolic type of leaders in a, in a different way. Not saying that they are apostolic, but they are the big heavy hitters. What an imam says goes. And I've watched and I've studied, I've read a lot of books, I've watched a lot of interviews, and here's what the imams would say that Jesus, yes, we believe in Jesus. He's even written about in the Quran. But what we believe instead of what Christians believe is we believe that Jesus was just a great prophet, just a great teacher. But I was watching this, this interview with who is considered to be one of their leading imams in all the world today. And he was asked a question by a, a Christian 
Arab guy. And the guy asked him this. He said this question to him. He said, but if we believe in Jesus and that he was a good man and a good teacher and a good prophet, then why don't we believe in his statements that he is the son of God? And here's what this guy basically said. I'm just summing it down. He said, we don't believe it because of the church. We don't believe it because of what Christians have made it to be. There's uh, Gandhi. You know, he, he said that I would be a Christian if it wasn't for Christians. What are people saying? What they're saying is this, that they, the message itself that Jesus came to bring is very believable, very inviting, but the religious institution that established itself on that truth has really tainted the message and turned off society from the truth. Am I making sense now? So this Iman is saying, but here's what he said, but I believe Jesus was a perfect man. I don't believe he made any mistakes. But if you don't believe that Jesus made any mistakes, that means that Jesus never lied. Are you with me? And if Jesus never lied, then what did Jesus say about himself? And look at this. Point number one for today is Jesus is either who he said he is or he's crazy. Because he said these things about himself and many more things. We're just taking three today. In John 8, 58, he said that truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was. Thousands of years can pass. It doesn't matter to Jesus. He's making a declaration, I am. And the religious leader said, Jesus, how can you say such a crazy thing because you were just born 30 years ago? And he said, I may have been born on this earth. I'm paraphrasing, but I may have been born on this earth, but I've always been. In John 1.1, 1, 1, he declared that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was sent to earth and manifested into flesh, and his name is Jesus, and he is full of both grace and truth. And look at John 10.30. Jesus said, the Father and I, we are one. And in John 14, 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one, no one, I'm going to repeat that about 10 times today, no one, I don't care what belief system you have, I don't care what culture you grew up in, I don't care what your society stands for, no one can come to the Father except through Jesus. These are some bold, radical statements. And here's what's crazy. In our society today, it's ever-changing at a, at a so fast rate it's hard to keep up with. What we believe as a society, what we accept, what we don't accept, what we stand for, what we don't stand for, it's all at an ever-changing rate. And with that said, if we want to follow what society thinks and says, we're following men, that have been, men and women that have been on the earth for maybe 20, 30, 50, 60 years. When we have a Bible that has been given us, the Word of God, that has been established for thousands of years as being accurate in history, and we believe that this is the very inspired Word of God spoken in to men's lives who wrote these books that we are reading from. Are you with me? On Wednesday nights, we're doing a series, Defend Your Faith. How to defend your faith. We don't have to defend Jesus. I'm not here today to defend Jesus. Jesus can defend himself. He's a big boy. He's bigger and better than I am. I don't have to defend God. He's, he's, he's Jesus' daddy. I, he, he don't need no help, right? I'm not here to defend the Bible. It has stood true for far too long. When people have tried to eradicate it off the earth, it has stood true and changed too many lives for it not to be, to be the book that God promised it it is. But what we want to do on Wednesday nights is teach you how to defend your faith in it, your belief system. Why do you believe in God? Why do you believe in Jesus? Why do you believe the Bible is God's word? We want to reinforce what, to help you know why you stand on the side that you stand. Because what Jesus has done by saying these things, he has drawn a line in the sand. And he has said, here's the deal. I'll take you just as you are. 
This is what he said. Are you tired? You worn out? Burned out on religion? Sick of the guilt? Sick of the shame? Come to me. You, 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 you've, you've done enough sin and mistakes to pile up to the highest mountain? No big deal. Come to me. I'll take you just as you are. But here's the condition. You've got to believe that I am the one. There is no other. There cannot be any compromise in Christianity in today's hour, nor tomorrow's hour, or yesterday's year. There could be, it could not, should not be, and cannot be any compromise in our belief system of the very foundation of what we stand on, that there is one Lord. No matter what anybody else says, no matter what any other religion tries to promote, there is one Lord. Lord, and his name is Jesus. So let me give you some statistics that I thought were incredibly inspiring to me. There's times I could feel like, man, America's, it's going to crap fast, right? Uh, the, 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 can I say that in church? Is that okay, Daniel? Yeah, that's okay. I want to make sure it's good in Swedish. All right. That it's, it's going down the pipe, you know. Our, our morality is slipping and the belief in our God is slipping. And, and there's truth to that. There's no doubt to that. But let me give you this study that was emailed to me by one, one of our members of the church here. Uh, she said, I thought this, you would find this very interesting. It is an article from Rasmussen where there was a study, an exhaustive study and poll done to Americans. And the, and the study starts off like this. In God, we trust. One nation under God. God bless America. And he goes on to say, It is no secret that faith in God is important to many Americans in one form or another. But just how important is God in their everyday lives? And how do they practice their faith? We decided to find out and poll America. Listen to this now. This is shocking. 75% of Americans will say that religion, any form of a belief in a higher power, 75% of our nation, 250 million people in America say we want to believe. It's important to me to believe in something out there, whoever he is that is greater than I, and this is why I'm here. So here it is. 25% of Americans are Catholic. And the other 20% of Americans are what we say are Protestant or Evangelical Christians. 4% are Jewish. And about 33% of Americans follow either some other religion or no religion at all. So here's the bottom line. 66% of America wants a relationship with Jesus. 66%. That's nowhere near what I thought it would be. If you asked me what I thought it would be, I would think it was down probably half of that at best. But 66% of America still wants a relationship with Jesus. Listen now. 36% attend a house of worship at some point during the week, but only 9% go more than one week a month. 29% say that they rarely or never go to any church of any kind. And but yet, here, listen to this, 50% of America prays to God at least once a day. I'm going somewhere very specific with this. If America wants Jesus by the majority... Why aren't they coming to Jesus? If America wants, if if America wants a relationship with the one true Lord, what is holding them back? And here's what the study says: it's the church. Because the church, not this church, not any specific church, we're talking the church as a whole. The church has gained a reputation in society to be rigid, to be rude, to be religious, to be all about rules and regulations. There's a lot of R's right there. Rigid, right? Rules, regulations, religious, to be rude. All of those things the church has become to be to our society. At least that's how the society perceives them. And I read this story. It was so funny to me. 
There was this guy, this part's not funny. There's this guy that was contemplating ending his life, and he was standing at the edge of a bridge, ready to jump. And a passerby saw him and yelled out to him, Sir, before you do that, can I ask you one question? And the guy said, Yes. And he said, Why are you about to end your life? And the guy said, Well, it's easy. Nobody cares for me. Nobody loves me. And the passerby said, but I can tell you at least one person I know who loves you. He said, who is that? And he said, his name is Jesus. Have you ever heard of him? And the jumper said, well, yes. I actually grew up in the church. I grew up believing in that stuff. And he said, you did? And he said, yeah. He said, well, what kind of church did you grow up in? Was it Catholic or was it Protestant? And the guy said, well, it was Protestant. He said, okay, out of the Protestant denominations, was it, which one was it? Was it Baptist? Was it, was it Methodist? Was it, was it Presbyterian? No, 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 no. It was Baptist for me. Me too. I, I grew up Baptist too. Well, what type of Baptist did you grow up in? Was it Northern or Southern Baptist? And the guy's like, well, Northern Baptist. Oh, man, me too. But have you grown up in Northern Eastern Baptist? Or have you grown up in the Northern Great Lakes Baptist movement? And the guy's like, the Northern Great Lakes Baptist Movement. And the, and, and the pastor back says, me too. Mike, look at this. Look what's happening right here. And he says, okay, okay. So one more question here. Did you grow up in the Northern Great Lakes Baptist Church established in 1892 or the one in 1910? And the guy's like, the one in 1892. And the pastor by shoved him off the bridge and said, Heretic! As he fell down to his death. Are you, are you with me? Religion is nasty. It's sick. It has no place in God. Religion wants to split. The devil's done an amazing job of, of establishing denominations and, and sects of Christianity where we have been so busy fighting each other, we forget what it's like to fight for a dying world. We've been so busy contemplating of what, should I believe this way or should I believe it? Here's what I got. I got good news for everybody here today. Here's what research is. Research isn't non-denominational. Research isn't denominational. Research isn't evangelical. Research isn't Catholic or Baptist or whatever. Here's what research is. We are a Bible-believing church. We are a church that is established on the book of Acts itself and established on the Word of God itself because here's what I got sick and tired of. I grew up like that. I was raised Catholic, then went Baptist, then went Jehovah Witness, then went Lutheran, and then went Assembly of God. And by the time I got through all five of those, I was more confused than the day I began. I was like, what the heck? These people all believe in one God, but they all believe so different from any other, and they're talking bad about one another. In the end, here's what I would rather do. I'd rather talk about the good of God than to worry about all those silly little things that split people up and keep us from being the church that we're supposed to be. So let's look if Jesus is saying that he is who he says he is. And if we know history shows us he was a great man who did a lot of good things and great things for people, then in the end, you got a choice. You either believe that he was just that and he was crazy at the same time, or you believe that this guy is who he said he is. He is truly the Son of God sent through the Virgin Mary and give, he gave his life for all humanity. But right then and there, the devil thought he had him defeated, but Jesus rose from the dead on the third day which we celebrate on Easter Sunday and he defeated death hell and the grave that's the one Lord that Reese Church stands on and believes in I just want it to be very clear today are you with me I don't want there to be any confusion society is confused enough and they have so many different beliefs I'll shout it from the rooftops as for me I will follow Jesus and there is no turning back, no turning back. I love him. I believe in him. I have a relationship with him. I don't, he doesn't lord and micromanage my life waiting on me to make mistakes. He is there to comfort me when I make them and help me to be better because of them. But the church, not us, not them, not the other ones. Don't be thinking of any specific ones. But the church as a whole 
We have turned off a society that wants God. Daniel, how much of Europe wants God? How much, how much is Europe is, is practicing Christians? 1.6% in Sweden. It's 2.5% in all of Europe. Sweden is one of the most godless nations on the planet. And, and, and we love for the European culture to sweep over to America, right? Bring it all. Socialism, skinny jeans, <laughs> soccer, cold football, you know, yeah. Let, yes, 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 yes. Uh. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> but with that said, guys, listen to this. We still have a nation that's looking for the truth, that wants it. And what they got to be able to have is they got to be able to have a place they feel safe at. See, what churches have also done, and I've heard it over and over again from many, many folks. Well, you know, we like the church. We like the music. We like this and that and the other. But, man, look look at all the different kind of people that come. And you know what I say? I say, good. Bring them all. You know what I want? I want every Muslim in Austin, Texas to come into Reach Church. I want every Buddhist. I want every atheist. I, I, I want every Hinduist. I want, I want every agnostic. I want every single person to come in. I want every businessman who's put, God, put money above God. I want, I want every thug gangster who is, who is trusted in his own abilities instead of finding the love that God has had for him. I want every student who has been confused and twisted in the, in the, in the, in the educational system of what a God is and what a God is not and how they got here and how they didn't. I want every single one of them to come into this church because why? Because we got the love of God and we got the truth of God. The grace and the truth need to be prevalent. We don't need to judge people. We don't need to criticize people. We need to invite every single one of them because here's the truth. The minute you start judging the world is the minute you lost the voice to speak into their life. And the minute you lost your voice to speak into their life is the minute that you have failed to accomplish the one mission Jesus gave us when he left to go. Go into the world. Tell them. Tell them the greatest message that's ever been told. That there is a God who is the author of all creation. And every bit that he created, he created through his son Jesus. Let's look at that together. Look at this. Number two. Jesus is the one true Lord. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, but for us, us believers, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created, and for whom we live. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created, and through whom we live. Look at that now. Jesus, Jesus is saying, to us through his word. There's one father. We, he created everything and he gave us life. But how did he do it? He created everything through Jesus and he gave us life through Jesus. Jesus is the key. Look at Colossians 1, 15 and 17 as we wrap up with this. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created, and he is supreme over all creation. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. This is who Jesus is. But you know the most important part of all of this? This is just words on paper. This is just words on a screen until you believe it. Jesus came. It says, Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, his main followers, his closest people to him. He said, who do people say that I am? And even his own disciples are saying, well, some Jesus, they're saying that you're just a great prophet. Others are saying you're, you're Jeremiah sent back to earth or Elijah or Elijah. Uh, there's so many people saying so many different things, and, and some of them were shaken, and some of them were a little bit confused. And, and, and he said the most important question that could ever be asked of any person on this planet, and he said this, okay, I know what they say, but what do you say? Who do you say 
I, the Son of God, am. And Simon, he stood up and he said, I say that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, well done, Simon Barjona. From now on, you're going to be called Peter, because the name Peter means rock. And he said, upon this rock, which means the revelation that you just had of who I am, upon that rock, I will build my church. And not even the gates of hell will be able to prevail against it. The church is built on one belief, and that is that there is just one Lord. Do you believe that with me this morning? Can we give God and Jesus just one big hand this morning? Guys, we're going to wrap up here in just a few moments, but this is the first Sunday of the month and every first Sunday of the month, not out of tradition or religious practice, but just out of an opportunity to honor and unite closer with Jesus, we're going to receive communion. Aaron, you could be playing now. I know you stopped because you thought I was going to preach more somewhere back there behind the veil. You're playing? Oh, it's not working. His guitar is not working. See if we can fix it back there. Boom! No, it didn't work. Okay. So with that said, we do communion the first Sunday of every month. And when we do communion, when we perform communion, here's what it's all about. It's all about coming into unity with Jesus. That's what the word communion means, to come into unity, to come one with, with one. And as the ushers come and they, they serve you these cups, you'll find uh, a little plastic part will give you the access to the wafer, and then the foil part peeled back will give you access to the juice. And I want to encourage you as we are going to receive this today. This is not, again, a religious or traditional act. Jesus said, do this always in remembrance of me. So we've made it a practice of giving all of our family an opportunity once a month to reunite and rekindle that fire in their heart, as well as those who may be coming for the first time or may be hearing this message for the first time about who Jesus is. We get folks from all kinds of walks of life. I loved first service, you know. we were Every service of, of reach, to me, it looks like heaven to me. It looks like what the kingdom of God should look like. It doesn't matter what you do, what you wear. It doesn't matter whether you got tattoos from your forehead down to your pinky toe, whether you got piercings. And none of that matters to us. What matters to us is that you're here, that you're here and you're open to the one true Lord who can radically change everything in an instant in your life. And that's what we're going to take partake of this morning. In this communion time, I just want to teach you for a moment. This is what Jesus said. He said, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Take the bread. It represents my body that was given for you. His body was, it was ripped apart, folks. A crucifixion in the Roman Empire days was the most horrific way to kill someone. His body was beaten so bad his own mother couldn't recognize him. And yet every lash, every lick, every thorn, every punch he took for us because we were worth it to him. And he said when we partake of the bread, we partake of his body and that we should believe in faith that we will be made whole in body and soul. Our mind, our will, our emotion, our physical body. If you got a sickness or a disease in your body, if you got some kind of emotional stress or disorder or some mental thing happening, some weight that's holding you back or confusion that's within your mind, then Jesus is about to set you free. Just believe that with us. And then he said partake of the cup, which represents my blood that was shed for you. And when you partake of the cup and you drink this, you will receive the joy of the Spirit. So in other words, when we do communion, the wafer is to restore, to unify the body and the soul with Christ, and the, the juice is to unify our spirit with him. All three parts that make us up, we come into unity with Jesus. And we're going to pray a prayer over this. I'm going to ask just for a moment before we receive it, if we can just bow our head and close our eyes. Just a time of reflection for you or where you're at. I, I don't know where you're at, but you do, and God does. 
And that's what this time is about, a reflection. Look in your heart. Are you where you need to be? Are you where you want to be with Jesus? Because it's so simple. Man has tried to complicate it so much, and it's the most simple message. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you ask him to forgive you of every mistake you've ever made and you confess that, then you, you're redeemed. You're forgiven. You're washed clean as white as snow. Your mistakes, your sins, they're taken and they're thrown as far as the east is from the west. In eternity, they're, ta- they're cast. Jesus said, I'll cast them in the depths of the sea and I won't even remember them. He not only forgives but he forgets. With heads bowed right now, eyes closed, I want to ask you, do you know him? Do you know that you know your heart is right with God through Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life? On three, if that is you, if you want to make such a commitment, or maybe you're out here today and you've made that commitment before, but you feel like, you know what, Pastor, my my life hasn't really lived up to that commitment I made, and I need to rekindle that fire, then this is for you as well. On the count of three, heads bowed, eyes closed, we're going to pray a prayer right there in our seats. But let me ask you, raise your hand on three if that's you. One, two, three. Can you put that hand up for me? Nice and high. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hands are up all over. Thank you, guys, for those hands. If you just raise that hand, just place it right on your heart, and then we're all going to pray, and I'm going to ask everybody here, join in with me, and let's pray this prayer together. Just say it to where your own two ears can hear it. Say, Father God, I come to you today in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for giving me the greatest gift. And Jesus, I believe in you, that you are the Son of God, that you gave your life for me. And today, I give my life to you. I surrender all. Help me to be who you've called me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to the Reach Church podcast. For more information, please visit our website, reachchurch.com.